in their culture in the first century, there was an understanding that when you said heaven and earth, you were referring to the temple in Jerusalem. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, a lot of people, they think of this verse when we talk about the Mosaic Covenant. They say, well, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. Why are you so hard on the law, Jonathan? Jesus didn't come to abolish. He came to fulfill. I don't know what that means, but we should probably be not so harsh on the law, right? Think about the implications. Not one jot or tittle, not one little comma or dot or stroke of the pen will pass away until heaven and earth passes away. Now think of the conflict. Heaven and earth is over here. Has not passed away, according to most of us. Over here <laughs> is 100% of the law. You are under 100% of the law. Every comma, every dot, you are under it until heaven and earth passes away. Well, that contradicts everything I said. You're stuck. Not under a little bit of the law, all of it, every little comma, you are stuck until heaven and earth passes away. Has heaven and earth passed away? Oh, we have some yeses. Yes. Hmm. This is a challenging thought because most of us, we just interpret it as physical heaven and earth. In their culture in the first century, there was an understanding that when you said heaven and earth, you were referring to the temple in Jerusalem. It was a slang idiom. It was a term that they used to refer to the temple and everybody knew it. And most of church history, everybody's known this. You go back and go through old commentaries before the 1800s, and it's understood in most commentaries that heaven and earth was referring to the temple. Actually, if you go back to Josephus, the Jewish historian who wrote about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, who was a witness to it, he writes in his book, and he talks about how they saw the temple as a picture, as a microcosm of heaven and earth. Because you have the, the Holy of Holies, this room where God's presence is, and the top of the Ark of the Covenant was actually called the throne of God, the mercy seat. It was not just a seat, it was a throne. It was a place where God's presence was enthroned on top of the box. So his throne is there, the walls are all embroidered and sewn with cherubims and angels, so it represented heaven. Then you step out into a place that has an earth floor, and you have over here the lampstand representing the sun, and you have the, the bread, which represents this is from the earth. And so you have this little world in this room that represents the earth, so heaven and earth. And if you go out a little bit further, there's a place in the outer courtyard called the bronze laver, which is a big brass bronze bowl of water. It was also called the sea. So the heavens, the earth, and the sea. So this setup, whether it was Moses' tabernacle or Solomon's temple or the second temple setup, represented heaven and earth and the sea. So you have this system. So Jesus says, none of the law will pass away until the temple passes away. Try it. 
Train C will last until the temple is destroyed. This is why also when he talks about the destruction of the temple in Matthew 24 in great detail, not one stone left on another. Um, In those days, uh, if you live in Judea, you need to run to the wilderness. And he gives all these specific first century instructions, which everybody understood. Literally, everybody understood Matthew 24 as about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD which is why the first Christian historian Eusebius writes and says, not one Christian died in 70 AD because they remembered the words of Jesus and they all fled the city when they saw the Romans coming in to take over. And they all went to a nearby mountain called Mount Pella and they survived the whole ordeal because they all understood Matthew 24 as very practical prophetic advice for them. So they all left, and not one Christian died. But in Matthew 24, you have this weird little phrase. In verse 34 and 35, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. The temple, the old covenant world, heaven and earth is going to be destroyed, but my words will never pass away. My new covenant world I'm creating for you, it will last forever. But this city down here will not endure, but we have a city that will endure. Present first century Ishmael, Jerusalem will be destroyed, but our heavenly Jerusalem from above will not. Hebrews chapter 12 starts to make sense at this point. In Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 18, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, or another way to say it, physical. You've not come to a physical mountain, a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire and darkness and gloom and storm to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it'll be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. You've not come to the old covenant mountain. You've not come to a physical mountain, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel spoke of judgment and vengeance in light of being murdered. It spoke of vengeance and judgment. The blood of Jesus is a sprinkled blood that speaks a better word, a better word of forgiveness. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Heavens and earth will be shaked one more time so that nothing of the physical created order of that world will remain. Only the kingdom that cannot be shaken will remain. It's it's like the first century Jerusalem with the temple and the old covenant system would be like a snow globe. 
And he's saying, look, I'm going to pick it up one more time and I'm going to shake it. And when we're done, none of it will remain. The only thing that will remain is my kingdom that cannot be shaken. It doesn't have a temple. It doesn't have a temple system. It doesn't have separation. It has a God who is unveiled. Everything has been changed. So this, whenever you hear somebody, you know, oh, the economy. Well, he said he'd shake one more time. Yeah, he did it a long time ago, which is great news because now you're in an unshakable kingdom. There's no more God shaking out of Hebrews 12. He shook and heaven and earth was destroyed and passed away. And now none of that order remains and we're free of the law and we're over here in an unshakable kingdom. He's an all-consuming fire. So what did he do? He burned Jerusalem to the ground. This is what happens in the first century. It's called the conflagration or the burning of Jerusalem. So it was burned, every bit of it. So this is the prediction, the prophecy of that is that he's a consuming fire. So you, he's saying, look, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him, how much less we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. God is warning in the first century, don't go back to the old. Don't hold on to this. The ship is going down. The ship is sinking. Get off the boat. So he's warning and he's warning and he's warning, speaking to them. And yet those who clung to the sinking ship went down with it. But all those who got off board because God is warning them, they made it out to Mount Pella. This leaves us in a, a spot that's really exciting and has so many applications. Because where we've mixed law and, and the old covenant into our new covenant, we're going to have to go through a filtering process of separating out. And it used to be, um, you know, we would grab onto these verses from the old, like Leviticus says, uh, you can't have a tattoo or, you know, you can't have a, a piercing or, you know, we had real specific Old Testament verses that we would grab and we'd drag them over into our church life and apply them to people. Remember? Some of you remember? And yet we've, we've gotten in a good way, very far from doing some of that. And yet there's still subtle ways that we do that. It's less obvious now. It's not as obvious uh, the level of, of Old Covenant stuff. And yet our, our view of the Father is probably what gets distorted the most. And our view, not just of the Father, but of how he sees us. The idea that we're this beautiful bride, that, that we are what he says we are, that we're partakers of the divine nature. These, these concepts, we still have trouble getting to them because we see ourselves as covenant breakers, law breakers. I'm not keeping it perfectly. He's the only one who ever kept it perfectly in all of human history. We have these concepts that float around and they keep us stuck. And we don't realize how stuck we are in some of these things. I'm hoping that eyes are being opened, that you've been forgiven, you've been resurrected, you've been made a new creation, you've been brought out of the grave, that heaven and earth has passed away. You're not standing under any of train C any longer, but you live on a new covenant train, and it's a whole different world. When, when you go through the book of Acts, what you actually are seeing in the background is the war between train C and the new covenant. And they're debating it through. Can Gentiles be saved? 
Can, can we eat meat that's offered to idols? Is that a thing? Is that a problem? Is it an issue? What about circumcision? Circumcised, uncircumcised, what do we need to do? All of these wars that are going on in the background of the book of Acts are waiting until the train C explodes. And we are free of everything from train C that was before. But because we forgot that train C has exploded, we still drag some things over. The reality is we literally cannot follow train C anymore. I mean, not just for our own good health. You literally can't. There is no temple in Jerusalem. There is no lamb sacrifice going on. Actually, the, the, when we look at the Jewish system nowadays, what I want you to understand is that it's not train C. <laughs> train C exploded. They can't follow train C anymore because there's no temple and no animal sacrifice, no day of atonement animal sacrifice, and God is no longer even honoring the outdated or obsolete system, but also they literally can't even do that system anymore. What happened after the destruction of Jerusalem, 1.1 Jewish people died, 8,500 priests were put to death, the temple was destroyed, every brick, every block, not one left on top of another. Even the Western Wailing Wall that is so famous was actually a wall that was outside and around the temple. It wasn't a wall of the temple. So the temple was completely annihilated. So from there forward, the Jewish people who were remaining, there was about 90,000 that were taken captive and sent as captives all over the ancient world at that point. When that happened, they switched to now what's called rabbinical Judaism. They can no, no longer gather around a, a temple because there is no temple. So instead, they gather around the local rabbi teacher. And it looks a lot like this, like a church, a pastor kind of situation. And there's no animal sacrifice. And the whole system has changed. So you're actually looking at a completely different religion. You're not looking at train C. Train C does not exist anymore. You're looking at something that had to go through a massive change and has become a different religion.